Hey there, I'm Zephyr Lasowski. I'm one of the poetry co-editors at Apogee. Thank you so much for watching this special reading from Poets published in issues 14 and 15 of Apogee. Since we didn't have a formal launch for those issues because of uh, the global pandemic in the past year, we're so excited to host these poets reading in this special asynchronous video for National Poetry Month. So I just wanted to tell you that uh, there is a donation option. There is a virtual tip jar that's set up just below this video in the description. I would urge you to donate. There are also links to publish, uh, to purchase the books of um, these writers. And of course, I encourage you to check out the entire past two issues of Apogee if you haven't. Thank you so much for your time. I'm just going to turn it over to the readers now, but I'm so excited to have you here. And thank you again for watching. Pangasinan Cora. In a plain ponytail and no makeup, we roll R's deep into the ground, taga inerbia. Earthbound on its axis, deturning or detuning, undertone, undersound, arrive out of neither from the cut where we hear ground rolling absent of meaning. Back channels say there is neither I nor you. Musakala Mga ui nang dulo. Ui DMs, okay, cute baby, into the buffering, a counterpoint to the front of house monologue at the behest of the disembodied mm -hmm. Yours and mine turn into a multi channel we the way Fred says we. Adu, antoy na nga mo. Ayong adu. If you're meeting someone you don't know, yung adu. Talako arrow, hindi siya malambot na o. Repeat what we like us saying, also what we don't like us saying, by mimesis record and roll us all disorderly into Cora. Aru antoi naran mo. What's archived by a language is not its working, as it sort of lays down an empty trap, a substratum. For us, second person singular is anto. But in a sentence, it's antoi, upon which focusing, smearing, binding, in, a, in an improvisatory here brings us back to what is written. Overheard, registered somewhere, channel, wordways, branch, headlong, double consciousnesses of lineage and fracture, say, sige siden, in which siden makes it sweeter. Naram. Hmm? Naram. 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 Mangan. Manga. Naxel. 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 Angapoi, Analu, Ompavil, Andakui, Sinilas, Abong, Nabuas, Mung, Galila, Magana, 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 Ak, Palia, Niluto, Baal. Susto, punte, tawen, waja, kawes. Winterra. Winterra. Ra. Ra. Kamusta ka la oi? Ako na lang lagi na yan. 
Nej, nej, nej. Nej, nej, nej. Nej, nej, nej. Nej, nej, nej. Aro, 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 Ya no me suelo tuya. Masamit. Wanga si nani? Hello, my name is Antman Pimentel Mendoza, and I will be reading two poems. The first of which was published in issue 15 of Apogee, and it's called Nagladlad. I wake into a dawn when Atte can tell us about justice. When I slow to breath, I deduct all units, detectives, and agents. In the evenings, I pardon my ungodly selves, justicia para caiganda, death to empire, an Americano sits in fatigues and clutches four coins close to the mother of pearl, waits for head, hands aflame, vision ox-blooded, until Ganda's stardust cheeks sink true blue, a hero ready-made. To unfurl into a goddessness like a flag big enough to mean nothing, big enough to gown. To swell into a silk, an older sister midnighting through the filigreed gate that might surround her family home to fold communion wafer breakable, to feed the village with my hellish body. And the second poem is called Figure Study of Bravery. Good morning. This is the morning I waited for. Dark wood paneled walls, S's cold hands, her warm heart, my baby blue tank top. Again, again. Good morning. Here at the door of my front teeth, we meet often the caffeine pang my chamber, my chamber, inky wells. Good morning from under this banner, from this hearth. On Catfish, the TV show, there are a few cliches, cars breaking down, non-functioning front cameras, a gender deception. If I understand dysphoria as the bite across the throat of euphoria, if my natural shade was pink lemonade or slime green, I'd keep my mustache. Good morning against translation. As a posture of consciousness, to borrow Sontag's characterization of will, if will is to style as my nail polish chips collecting in the holy catch of the kitchen sink basin, is to a future impossible. Good morning, good morning, we've made it. My earnestness is a bravery, an index finger tightly tucked under her neighbor. Thank you. Hi, I'm S. Brooke Korfman. Um, I'm going to read my poem in Apogee, Sonnet Expanding with the Memory of Another Life, and then one more poem. Sonnet Expanding with the Memory of Another Life. When I wake, I spill the cup. It spills each cup placed lip to lip. I didn't used to deal with stress by sleeping through it, but now I think I'm sick. Now I trouble the sky, close and open my eyes to idolize the pink animal at the bedside or the flat world. Waiting, C tells me of her superstitions, 
their blessings those I gave up when young, but here in the river am trying to get back. The rock leaves the water smoother than it entered, but smoothness too is a kind of texture. I invent rituals out of gut feelings, let the shape of the room shape a fate. I photocopy a poem about dandelions, and my wrist also appears. Inexplicably, I cry, this hand that lights the candle, that writes the cup. I wish for a curse, for the specificity of a single desire, but it does not arrive. I am ashamed. I did die, I remember. I did wear lace collars in another life, or silk, rose from my feet as a conduit, spoke aloud. What I find beautiful is not beautiful to everyone. Um, and this is the first poem from my most recent book uh, called My Daily Actions or The Meteorites. Um, the poem is called Premonition. Premonition. In the field, hands rise like wildflowers. Each nail painted a bright color. Teal, sunflower, tangerine, lapis. From your vessel, I dip the paddle to the dirt. It moves as water, a reversed river. A single door, ornate, leads only to the rest of the meadow. When I am alone, I sometimes stand like the women of those worlds, which are my own sacred texts. I hold a scepter shaped like a key, turn from the Torah toward a magical girl. A beautiful form appears with a warning. The valley will burn, or the sky will firm as weight. These are not inevitable, but I react to specific demands. For example, let time move forward never go through the door. So I wait and watch what moves in the meadow. Each step toward or away from the door becomes impossibly detailed. Thank you. Subscribe to Apogee. Hi, my name is Dashara Sykes Joe. I'm gonna be reading some poems for you. I am so grateful to be a part of issue 15. I'm so grateful to the staff and I'm so grateful to be featured among so many amazing writers. My first poem is called Strength of You after Ari Saleh's Gishmai. You are homeless, bound to the thought of freedom, no grass, dragging your right hand across the ink, messy, Quiet, the combination of enough and not quite, making shadows, lights out. Ask for the things you need, you, Mississippi clay, sweet, ham hock, cursed vegetarian, disowned, but still, say, say who you are and mean nothing. Foot in your mouth, constant choke, planted. Tell me who you are, again. Why is everything a question about the internal, eternity and thereafter, sound vibrating against itself? O oh, is ooh, lowercase wondering, liberation of how big O oh, really is. By and O, oh, and get inside, circle it with your tongue. You is deceived doubled and pleading for more. Use me and say it was good. Am I a fortress? You saw me and lost nothing. You turned away. You forgot my name. You pretended to be grounded in the foundation of you. You is disillusioned. You love the way we play. Come back and act like you need me. Stamp my hand, gold star, gold star, gold star. Gold is just metallic yellow and yellow is just, is this the reason for my arrival? This is the radiant part, the part that glistens. I will go inside the sun and burn off the delicate pieces. You are no longer needed. Thank you, so. Thank you, no.
Leaving is not a departure, it's calling. The maze, a straight line. Clear space and call it mass. Paw Paw sign the paper. Jesus comes in many forms. Yes, but when I say I am also him, you say no. I am not angelic, broken cross, oh, crucified me, thorns decorate my temple, I cannot hear you, la 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 la, I cannot hear you, la 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 la, thank you, thank you, I will bow, I am the saint of all petty, foot working on your fable, Jesus did not die, Jesus did not rise, he hired a stunt double, I do my own stunts, surprise, I'm a treasure trust, the wizard, less discolored, I speak in twists, the meaning is the start, the start is at the end, yellow bricks were too expensive, I parted my coils down the middle and saw the sea, you wanted to see it all again. on the last day. When I rebuked the church, I was really rebuking the body in which I came, drained the dirty pool meant to hold my sins. There will be no baptism today. I can't swim or I won't keep swimming for a mother who only asks for blood. I offer this body as sacrifice. Return me to the slush that formed my soft into the devastation I am now. I'm done with begging for salvation, tithing with lint or pleasing my grandmothers. What is the prize for being saved? A husband? an eternal life or a promise at rest. Return me to space and, and the stars that burn just to run across the sky. I will be better there. A cozy grave, delicious burial, a chance to stop spinning in circles as the destruction dries. I mean, I am not my parents. I am not so insistent on living. I surrender. I give back this body that creaks. I give back these eyes who have seen enough gore to last and last. I give back the snows that smells, the rancid will of people who cannot love this earth. I give back this mouth that has stalled, afraid of who suffers under the true account of this world. If heaven is what I should reach for, please let it be a quiet box. Let it be kind. Let it be swift, merciful. Everything this place cannot deliver. Thank you. Hi, my name is Suzanne Highland. The first poem I'm going to read today is called Survey from issue 14 of Apogee Journal. Survey. What is your nature? An endurance. Has it always been your nature? Yes, in that I've never been able to separate it from plastic in the ocean. Describe your nature without using words like masculine or feminine. How does your nature impact your experience of humanity? All day, I've been tuned to a royal wedding. Your sex life? I should stop telling flowers, they're in my poems. Your body? Floating overhead. Panic balloon. History? I don't understand the question. Your history. I saw a deer inside a cathedral today. A deer? And I learned about pine tree varieties. I counted the kinds and felt sorry. What else did you learn? I forget, which is exactly what's meant. How does your nature impact your experience of the environment? The seabirds have bellies full. How do you relate to those who share your nature? The ocean is crowded with us. How do you relate to those who don't share your nature? The deer looked up, almost in reverence. I found my first gray hair today. 
And I bought a new lighter today, blue with lemons and oranges. And the snow that was rain became snow became rain today. And my childhood best friend and I planned a road trip from coast to coast today. And when she went silent for 10 days, she was thinking of her father who three months ago today had a clot in the lungs, which needed space and air to properly function. And it was sudden, it stopped him, he fell to the floor. I have a name. It was at the end of her text. He fucking died, Susie. She talked for the first time today and she asked me to talk. And I told her about my gray hair. And she said she thought it was lovely that there's a place for everything, even if it's only to slow us down, to allow us to formalize which moments we will grieve and which we will not. When we were teenagers, we screamed at each other in the heat of her minivan. We laughed for each other when no good was happening. We floated, holding hands on the salt water. The sun moved across the sand like a cataract. The sky was as diamond-like as I'm told no one would ever believe. But I'm saying it. I'm saying it right now. Life was perfect. Not today, but soon. We'll drive to the ocean on the other side of the highway. I will see her where we'll both look better than we looked in the sun. I will be with her there among the tall red trees. My last poem is called Things We Need Plastic For. Live cam on my computer screen. New Zealand, two northern al royal albatross preening while an overloaded container ship churns below, below the smoky cliff line. They stretch their huge wings. They nicker at each other. Then gaze a while at the colorful diminishing stacks. Gaze as if they're thinking about the ship, about whether it's alive, where it's going, what it carries, what it means to see one after another, 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 another. Already asleep in their time zone, the albatross touch beaks. It's tomorrow there. It's taking light years to get to us. Thank you. In response to feeling alone. Everything's been known before us, okay? The clouds disappear the sky sometimes, or they become it. When we stood on Seminiac Beach like a pair of exclamation points, we heard the same offing tone heard when someone went to look for their father's corpse in 1965, didn't we? Please. Don't make me explain this. After the fact, a siren seesaws by my open window. Passing on the street, a voice in a phone says, no, I'm alone now. So it's possible ghosts also vacation from what's to come. How many people can you name who want to be loved without enthusiastically loving back? The common cause of disappearances costs us. We live in the aftermath. In other words, if one more person tells me the country of my father's birth is cheap, I will lose it. In other words, this is the only language I speak. To my slightest disappointment, I'm just writing to say hello. No need to write back. Don't get me wrong, waiting isn't passive, but what if they never found him? Spoiler alert, you already know they didn't, or they found him a thousand times, a thousand times. The story I was told was cooked on a soaking wet skewer, piercing the meat of it through and through. In other words, an implication. Not to change the subject, but if you think an apocalypse will eliminate the wealth gap, let's hold together the premonition it will not. Admiration turned me into a housefly, repeating my body against a window trying to get out. I lied low about having let particular men touch me, but don't leave me alone now before I recover. Their spines turned in on the shelves reveal thick 
wads of time I spent in omission. Gentle paper, I ask for it back. Doubtless, this moment is our opening. Hey, Diamond. Sorry for the delay. Just got caught up doing one thing and then the next thing. But I'm glad to be able to get this out to you. I'm really curious about what you think, what you what you feel. Um, I know that this might be a little confusing or disorienting because I never know where to look. <laughs> I never know where to look on these things. Um, the camera is going to be over here and the poem over there. So I'll be looking over here, but glancing back <laughs> while I read it. Um, sorry if it's disorienting. One thing I thought about uh, in preparation for reading it for you is the fact that I'm calling it um, Thoughts is an acronym for basically those hoes over there. So the poem is my effort to sort of lift up and illuminate the perspective of sex workers. You know, folks who have to deal with the rut and grind, whether they're into the person or not. And so just having them sort of stand up for themselves and say, look, I'm calling this thoughts. We're envied sonnets. And then going into their stories. I hope that gives you more of a, a, an anchor, a sense of perspective of where I'm coming from with the poem. But I'm looking forward to what you have to say. So I'm not trying to frame it. So let's get into it, Sheila. Into it, Black Hour. <laughs> Thoughts. Us envied sonnets. Tame the navel, run me worn. Oh, gee, pop. <laughs> Disrobe bullies gin slurs. Meet us bone even. Lap comes solo, sad as voodoo went. He encodes me, scab valve. The analogy coding, ink, teal, lush, aw, oh, sweet. Night meant I tend an alleged trend. Cheap navel waves, etched paws open, feces I kept. Yet edited ho gloom greeted courted giver when Mecca Hills rip. Damsel eye, aquaculture eye, till enameled vents on one wearing Venus Nova. Intimates I let bleed, etching sun. Tell heaven why, Negroes, the red rave apt, give in. <laughs> Hose tent feigned gazer, felt boom, even had do dot tinkle sweet moon wet. Evoke jerk parade, top sail kiss beneath a traveled henna, a buzz neon ill shit. A lawn riot, concuss ion fang. Feed violin joy, rent me, bridge me, clone ticks, I rut. Rad poet harem we, lens toe turning, newest disco hit, sheen. A seance, let lit mains fro, unseal in a wild tin, rev the zoo, splinter male chin. Jam sped leg and vent unseen. Eve cheers. Joins languid burrow opera. See tall butch sat rotor. I warm daughter. Tide canoe. Wallow want intent. New TV dream babe shown. Ye token ho footnote. Gee. Jig works. Rears talk. <laughs> Jade Smulder's boob MC evergreen. Elm lint now. A wet khaki joke. <laughs> okay. Let me know what you think. Peace. Hi, um, my name is Irvi, and I'm going to be reading two poems today. 
Thanks to Apogee for inviting me to do this. Um, so the first poem is titled Far Away From Home, I'm Hungry, and it appeared in Apogee's issue 14, and I wrote it after the poet Jane Wong. We wake to find our lives have been quartered. We hold at bay the knife just a little longer. Such tedious operations in repair, we begin to stitch. Downstairs, my mother slices a guava. How do I translate its constellation of seed, tart white flesh, a quick silver moon? This and every afternoon, there's more. Volda drums. This is the swarm of a depthless summer. Boil the water, fry the bread. We bite into raw tomatoes in between meals. We sack the ripe curve of its flesh. We demand its red underbelly. Antils of rice, my grandfather making a hole for ghee. No one's allowed to not eat. There's still so much stitching to do. But in the meantime, someone grate the carrot. It's time for halva. Nani surveys the kitchen. We gather all the ginger we can find. Someone clean the coconuts. Gently crack open their heads. Someone pass the rotis to the dog. Someone watch. The gravy is boiling over now. We understand no love that is not in excess. Here are thickets of sugar. Here are spoonfuls of kacha am to lacerate your tongue. More, please. Here we hang on to the cook sari, asking, oh when, oh when, oh when. Here our hands become one with what we eat. Later, we all belch in private, fall asleep, our bellies swollen, hungry for something else. Um, and then this next poem is called Art Class, and it's definitely still in the draft stages, um, but I'm glad to share it with you today. Art Class. I picked a banana apart, stroke by stroke, made shadow before object, object before light. Deepshika Ma'am showed me where road disappeared, turned to sky, fell into my lap. The only boy in class saw my underwear and told me so. I was shading with soft pastels, powdering my thumbs, my face, maybe even my vacant back, emerald green on black paper, the seeds of a papaya, a glinting knife white granny panties, my art teacher's mellow, round face, swollen with shock, with pity. Years later, in a collared sweatshirt and tall boots, we find each other on a flight, begin to catch up. I worry, I smell bad. I crawl into my smallest body. He probably doesn't remember. My lines too precise, tapering where anyone could see. I turned away, I kept shading, black bars and glass panes, filling in windows where two-dimensional people turned off their lights, made popcorn, boiled ginger and water, lay on the floor, throwing tantrums, climbing into private underwear, drawing the curtains. Um, and that's all for me. Thank you for listening. I work. Sky crumples on the way to the work day, my least dear fact, that only exists in its performance of my dutiful choral citizenship, proclaiming I work, accumulating lush oddness, high drama in the rain. Something rugged makes fatty my emotion, and it will only be a matter of time, they sing, until my invocation becomes a hiring notice. And I realize I didn't mean to ask for money. I meant to ask for a different set of relations. And if they kill me or my house, the proof of occupancy won't be made of matter. It will be made of anger. And mattering is swept behind a workforce, stumbling on gritty rules and sorrow. But I work, I will have to remind them, as if to prove aliveness, to outshine my debt's reputation before the sentence begins. Mm. 
cytokinesis. Life begins in declaration, durational. Breath gaily proliferates the weather inside my haiku. Our seed's kink is mitosis, wet and procreating itself alone with its sisters. The spitting image of dreamlike pain. And when it rains, it roars, it paints me wet, it edges my comfort. In that pause of the shut door, that restless squeeze, my partial object, the shyness of my nothing, my throaty feelings that I couldn't language in time. Like I began before sound, you heard, and I couldn't explain that viscous ontology that my being violently precedes my declarations. And in waiting it out, my stakes performed me, in bed, all political, damp, and virile, this scarcity, your refusal of my frame. Hi, everybody. My name is Alice Leanne. Thanks, Apogee Journal, for hosting me for National Poetry Month and for featuring my work. Today I'll be reading two poems. The first one is from Apogee's issue 14 called Trade Wars. Trade Wars. My father paid my first tariff, a penny for each word his mouth failed to form in English. What adventure bedtime stories became. Late nights, dad sweats his retirement against the stock market. After hours, a teen wipes her brow, adjusting bright orange price tags. At seven, a boy and his new toy smeared a Made in China sticker on my forehead. After all this time, I still can't take a joke, the guck stubborn on my skin. In China, surveillance lurks about in silent shudder. Here, the white gaze steadies on my lower back. There, babies told not to born. Here, mothers made to birth. On the train, you tell me about all the nascent atrocities in China as if I've never met my first womb. It's not, not the shape of my intestines tangle. Over here, someone shushes a young child's gurgle. Out there, morning bells blare on someone's first day of re-education testing for what the body won't forget under force. Let's talk about assimilation, the negotiated speech between us. I choose not to escalate. Instead, I whisper to the static of wool reaching from your ribs to mine in half-hearted agreement. It's true. At some point, I packed up that passport at the counter and exchanged it. On some day, I sealed that language shut and returned it. On the silent walk back to my unfeeling apartment, I tally all that love costs in an economy of fear. The second poem I have for you today is a really old poem that I wrote at a time when that felt very close to now um, in that it felt like an emotional kind of lockdown, like a quarantine I had set myself in. And so I think that's why I've been finding myself returning to this poem um, during this time when now we're physically in that state. This one is called Love Does. Love does not want this body cold like when the heat in our apartment shut off and it was still winter and the storms that came would rattle the bare backyard branches whose job it was to hold the phone lines in just so. This was the imminent fragility and the frigid immobility of it all. My body paralyzed like pavement, covered in blanket, like white sheet pulled overhead, like holy robe waiting to be worn at home. Oh, cold body does not want this love, which is to say it was difficult, the waiting. But they say that the heart is devious above all else and mine knew it was not ready to be as light as spring. What winter gave me without the distractions of late summer sun casting crowns on newly birthed treetops was the quiet, and with it the inevitable wrestling with God waiting for me. Want of cold does not love this body like I do, chided God, as she came in with winter as weapon, as cure for the ways I fought with arrogant loneliness and broken artifice. 
She held me defeated and left me cocooned in long-sought slumber that dreamt past the demons who live in my eyelids and catch prayers in the in-between. Even in the depths of winter, bare trees will grow roots. Could this not be a body of love too? Thank you. Hi, my name is Alexis Aceves Garcia, and I'm so excited to be celebrating National Poetry Month with Apogee Journal. I'm gonna be reading two poems for y'all whenever and wherever you are. Um, the first poem is from issue 14. It's called, I'm tired of working for eccentric white men. And by eccentric, I mean maybe as boys, they TP'd entire cul-de-sacs, went to Princeton and are now making six figures. Or maybe I'm working for a Catholic high school white boy, like the ones I used to smoke out at parties before they grabby handed my friends after a few too many lost beer pong games. The all boys school was called Saints, but their names were actually Matt or Russell or Nate or Kyle or Kyle or Kyle. And they all graduated white with swoopy bangs and went to work white and did acid once. Once Will, my boss at Time Magazine, called me into his office to practice the Spanish he learned on Duolingo, confidently pulled out his iPhone 6, and the Spanish whispered, El pan, el pan. Listen to this. His thin lips let out a pan, like Peter Pan, like pots and pan to my ear. And did he think of me even once at his seaside destination wedding in Mexico? Once Justin, the president of an advertising company, told me he'd plan my birthday celebration, gathered everyone in the main conference room, stuck a lit candle into an override avocado and had the office sing happy birthday in Spanish while Selena played on the Sonos. Sometimes I think God is a capitalist. Sometimes I think manager is another word for a white man who brings me in for interviews or meetings and never says one beautiful, genuine thing. Need some sparkling water after that one. Oh my God. <laughs> white men, y'all. I'll leave it at that. So this next and last poem is called Inner Child Meditation. And one thing I've been thinking a lot about is my inner child and connecting more with them. And wearing these earrings is kind of a part of that. They're little frogs, if you can see. And I'm having a good time with them on my ears today. Inner Child Meditation. I float through a cave lit with candles towards a field and meet my inner child on a bench. We are in the park behind our old house on Moore Park Street. There is a bounce castle, each tower trembling with the footsteps of children in our periphery. The narrator tells me to introduce myself and I do so in Spanish. They are shy wearing a high ponytail with their hands covering their face, a pink Power Ranger roundhouse kicking on their t-shirt. I sit and bend down to greet them, voice a plush stuffed animal. The year is 1995. They take my hand and introduce me to their toys. I meet Star Wars figurines they stole from their older cousin Han Solo frozen in carbonite, Princess Leia holding a blaster in her right hand, buns tied to her plastic face. We play, I follow their lead. It is always a rescue mission. Somewhere above us, a voice tells them to show me what they're most afraid of. The toys fall from their hands. 
We are in the backyard of their preschool. Children run around wooden picnic tables. It's nap time. They're awake staring at a map of the world. I am too big to fit on a mat. We are bigger than the map. They point at a teacher, then to the whiteboard piled with English. We spell our name in the laminated alphabet, peeling from the wall above. A is for apple. L is for lost. E is for berry. We misplace Spanish in our sleep. X is for a tiny hard drive replacing itself. I am holding myself when the voice tells me to return. We capsize the teacher's desk in the time stop, our small hands working in unison, clay dough over the lines in the mat. When we're done, I am pulled into the air by my shirt collar. They follow from the parking lot of the preschool as I balloon towards the cave. I darken the clouds as I pass, lightening the sky. My sobs a steady thunder outside the cavern's wet mouth. The candle's ancient wax leaked on limestone. I climb into the abandoned body, a child. Thank you so much again for having me. I hope that ease and tenderness find their way into your day.